Uh, after 30 seconds, you can start, sir. Just give me a cue at 10. Please start, sir. Okay. Very good evening to all of you. It's a warm welcome from us to you for this certificate course in hypertension management, a case-based approach, which is an uh, initiative by the Indian Society of Hypertension in collaboration with Serdia, an arm of Servia Laboratories. And uh, as we know, today is the day one of this uh, four-day certificate course, where we, wherein we will have a panel of eminent doctors and moderators who will come uh, together uh, to discuss uh, hypertension in a detailed case-based manner. So, so before we delve into uh, the course and before we uh, uh, start with the proceedings for the day, uh, this is me, Dr. Arun Sharma from the Serdia Pharma team. So just to give you a brief introduction about what we are and what we do uh, in this uh, sphere. So Servia or Serdi, as we know, it's an international pharmaceutical group, which is governed by a non-profit foundation. So we are entirely independent. And as we said, it's uh, governed by a non-profit foundation. Daily 100 million patients are treated worldwide with Servia medicines. When it comes to cardiology, we are a force to be reckoned with, being fifth worldwide. And as a group endeavor, 25% of the total revenue is invested every year in R&D. What Serdia supports is brands produced in India, even well before the Make in India initiative became a, uh, a vocal thing. There are no Chinese APIs and all the raw material is sourced from a single factory in uh, Europe based in France. So this is what Serdia supports. And before we start the session, uh, a humble, uh, uh, heartfelt gesture from our end for all healthcare professional pharmacists and those involved in supply chain. Thank you for your service, especially during these troubled times. Really thank you from the bottom of my heart. And now coming to the proceedings for the day, as you all know, today is the day one of this four day certificate course series. So we will have two eminent speakers, of course, and we'll also have a very renowned mod moderator for the day. So I will start first with the introduction of the moderate, uh, the moderator followed by uh, uh, the two eminent speakers introduction. So this is broadly the agenda of the day, how it sits. So we'll have two sessions wherein the case would be discussed by the two eminent speakers for 15 minutes. There'll be a panel discussion involving both the speakers and of course the moderator followed by Q&A and followed by the vote of thanks at the end. So it's my pleasure to invite our very eminent moderator for the day, a name that does not require any formal introduction. Of course, it is none other than Dr. Sandeep Seth. So Dr. Sandeep Seth, as we all know, Sir is a professor at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and he heads the heart failure and transplant services at the Department of Cardiology. Dr. Sandeep Seth is also the chief editor journal of practice of cardiovascular sciences. And under his tutelage, the funding from ICMR, DST, DBT, British Council, NIH, to name a few, uh, for heart failure, biomarkers, stem cell therapy, yoga, and even Ayurveda, they have been instituted. And to his credit, Sir has more than 200 publications till date. So now I hand over the session to uh, Dr. Sandeep Seth, Sir, our eminent moderator for the day. And he can proceed with the speaker introduction and the session. So, Sir, over to you. Thank you, Arun. So we have a very exciting session today. We have two eminent speakers. We don't really need an introduction. But anyway, we have Dr. Oday Yadav. Uday Yadav is uh, working in cardiovascular imaging, atherosclerosis, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. He's from Mumbai. He'll be talking about uh, hypertension in the young, followed by Dr. Sumitra Ray. Dr. Sumitra Ray is a professor in the Vivekanand Institute of Medical Sciences. He's also a director in invasive cardiology. He's published extensively, both nationally and internationally. Both are excellent speakers. They will be covering hypertension first in the young and then in the elderly taking examples and we will have a very exciting session. We'll start with hypertension in the young, Dr. Uday. Let's start. I'll request everyone to mute their audios. 
Yeah, so before now I share the screen, may I thank, uh, we are really blessed to have Dr. Santosh, Dr. Sandeep Shekh today to be with us as a moderator. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we also have Dr. Somit Rore after me, one of our very esteemed speaker, excellent orator and a man of great wisdom. So it's always a pleasure to have such luminaries to share, the, to share our interactions today. May I now start my presentation? Let me share the screen and uh, all right. So let us talk about hypertension in a young patient in a very short presentation. So look at this young gentleman. He's 30 years old. Uh, he's revisited hospital after 15 days with some sort of heaviness of the head and a blood pressure that has not been controlled. Uh, lifestyle intervention was suggested as per all the guidelines before 15 days for a blood pressure of 138 by 90. His blood pressure was not very well controlled. He has a sedentary lifestyle. He doesn't follow the usual patterns, but fortunately he has uh, no smoking or drinking. He has a blood pressure history in his father who had been in his mid 50s, otherwise on a sedentary lifestyle. He is not very obese. His heart rate is 75. So we keep that in mind, by the way, because he's a young chap. And the blood pressure is 155 by 100 and 160 by 99 in the right arm and in the left arm. His clinical examination has been normal. When you see such a young person, then you naturally look for everything to look for a secondary cause of hypertension. Um, uh, it's imperative that you touch the feet of the patient, as they say. Check his uh, dorsal speedies. Be sure that you feel the carrot is well, the femorals well, and there is no carotid brewing. The laboratory profile of this patient says, generally speaking, it's okay. Total cholesterol is 165, which is reasonable. You may have different uh, stringent rules to get it further down, but 165 is reasonable and rest of the parameters are okay. He does not have a thyroid disease and his EKG shows no other abnormality. There is no left ventricular hypertrophy. So what we need to do in terms of complete diagnosis is just get his blood pressure uh, properly confirmed that he does really have it. So uh, I guess uh, we go by the guidelines and we go by exactly what you should do in the COVID days. Ask the patient to purchase a good validated blood pressure monitor. Check it at home two times a day, seven days. Take an average, let you know what the readings are and then be sure that it truly has hypertension. Check out his risk uh, uh, factors. Be sure that you have access clinically causes for secondary hypertension. And that's a poll question if you want. So you may want to answer whether it's all of the above or one of the three. I don't know whether the poll is going to come right now or at the end. What is it that we do for secondary hypertension? So few things I said that you want to check for radio femoral delay. You want to check the carotids and the femorals. You do the ballot for the kidneys and be sure that the kidneys are not enlarged. That's vital for polycystic um, adult kidney disease, the APKD in the younger patients. Neurofibromatosis is lesser common. You check for manifestations of pheochromocytoma. Check for abdominal strike, obesity for Cushing's disease. Look for hyperthyroidism. Hypothyroidism may be associated disease. Hyperthyroidism may actually contribute with a very high basal metabolic rate. So you have tachycardia and you have a rise of systolic blood pressure. At times you have a systolic murmur or the pulmonic area. All right. Now, once you have a new onset of uncontrolled hypertension in a adult patient and you have assessed him, then you look for the secondary screening. And um, you may not do the secondary screening in every single patient. There may be few parameters. Look at the family history. Look at those clinical signs. Look at a hypertension that has suddenly shot up. Look at an unprovoked hypokalemia, mind you you may get with aldosteronism a normal potassium. So it's not that you only look at hypokalemia and take a call on whether patient has a, a secondary hypertension, right? You may have patients whose potassium could be normal and yet could have a primary aldosteronism or on the other way around, their potassium could be high and he may not be truly a, a, a 
hypertensive patient with a secondary cause and you also will have to rule out the hemolysis when you check the uh, the blood uh, so, sir so just to interrupt we got the answer for the poll 92% say all of the above which is quite fair right uh, arun uh, is quite fair so now we go further look at this hypertensive with no organ damage and no secondary hypertensive so now we are sure now what else i do because i got a minute here uh, uh, the imaging in my opinion plays a great part have been involved with ct imaging i can tell you that that uh, it's a very cost effective way and at one screen you can do a ct renal angio and look at the renal arteries the aberrant renal arteries the parenchyma of the kidneys the aorta the coag look at paraganglionomas look at bladder pheochromocytoma look at adrenal pheochromocytoma all in one go most of the things which anatomically you can pick up how will you treat can you vote here you decide is target bp goal as a management protocol you look at lifestyle advice bp lowering both of the above none of the above this is fairly simple dr arun and uh, you are not going to say none of the above otherwise we are not going to sit through this meeting it has to be something which is proper what should be the blood pressure target less than 140 by 80 with non cv less than 130 by 80 without a cv risk factor now that that's important right if you have a cv in a young patient do you want to have it less than 140 by 80 do you want to separate a young patient in this fashion or you don't believe this is the way you have to go about it you just want to stick to a target please vote now so 90% say for the last question all of the above the one previous to this yes sir and the one here uh, the second one yes this one sir what should be the management approach yeah, yeah that i got that's fair yeah. what should be the target bp goal for you here yes they are just voting so we need to give 10 seconds yes. good good yep the first one was precise both of them so when I, you have said 90% 10% may not have voted at all in that particular Of course, it was pretty straightforward. So, what is it? We have got Dr. Arun some sort of clue here. Yes, sir. We are just getting collating queries. So, fifty-three percent go with B and forty-six percent go with C. That's fantastic. That's so. See how we are divided on this. Well, the point is, this is a matter of great discussion. If you have a young hypertensive, mind you, this is not an elderly hypertensive, and he has a known CV risk. and he has no known cv risk we are not talking of cv disease it's just the risk how are you going to approach are you going to sort of uh, look at it differently we will get to this when to initiate medical treatment there are four questions dr arun which are posed here immediate yes. drug treatment in all these young patients immediate drug treatment only in those patients whom you think are at a higher risk give him a lifestyle advice for 3 months and then initiate a treatment or you look at the bp you look at the risk profile and then start the treatment please vote so as of now it is 50 50 for b and c for 3 it's 50% where where people feel just give him three months of um, good lifestyle and then initiate it and 50% says look clinically and decide which is fair enough i think right. it's a way of looking of how you are going to approach uh, in terms of real life practice guidelines of course are going to be a little aggressive for us straight everyone but well whatever said and done a target blood pressure should be reduced by at least 20 by 10 i think we should accept that get it down to less than 140 by 90 for all below the age of 65 years get it less than 130 by 80 and as esc says don't try to get it down to less than 120 by 70 maybe home blood pressure of 120 by 17 in young diabetics is okay but otherwise let's keep it uh, beyond 120 by 70 but surely get it down to less than 130 by 80 so that's what the guideline says here are 2018 guidelines which talks exactly as you were recommending me through your poll if it's high normal or hypertensive or grade 2 whatever it is lifestyle comes first and then consider the drug treatment in in a high normal blood pressure in very high risk patients especially with cvd 
especially with CAD, and immediate drug treatment, of course, if there is somebody who has just a grade one, but is at a high risk or has got a renal disease, then there is every reason to say, okay, let us, let us be a little quick. So the point is, let us be wise, but let us be quick. That's, that's how simply you have to look in clinical practice. And in young patient, uh, office blood pressure will have to be lowered at this point of time. All right, I'm sorry this screen got a little. All right, okay. So here are the blood pressure thresholds uh, and recommendations for treatment of follow-up. And it tells you almost on similar lines that if someone has a stage one hypertension, you look at the ACVD risk, prescribe them a non-pharmacological approach to life. Assess earlier within a month, that's a class one indication or a little later if you may want to, want to do that. But in my opinion, we should not in India follow too much of lingering around and delaying because that's beating our charts of diagnosing, optimizing therapy and getting quick results. I think earlier we look at patients, the better it is, immediate drug treatment for all patients with stage two hypertension. So lifestyle, stage one, essential and optimal. And in essential, when you say yes, then you start uh, uh, in those at low risk, supply lifestyle intervention for three to six months. And then if it, it's not working, you may want to start. All right. Very busy slide. And um, it talks about continue to offer it periodically. Start with a clinic blood pressure. Go to ABPM or HBPM. Here is my opinion straight away on this. Clinic BP in today's date is going to be a tough challenge. Let's get on with the HBPM and get average, as I said where the blood pressure on a HBPM is remaining above 135 by 85. That's the time when you may want to start looking at a ABPM to be sure that you maintained a balance. But someone's blood pressure is at home getting consistently less than 135 by 85, you are okay with it, right? Now, all these guidelines are not very seriously looking at young hypertensives as a separate guideline. There are some recommendations here and there. So how do we treat this patient? You are aware of it. Salt restriction, DASH diet, healthy diet, absolutely regular physical activities to the whatever permissible levels are, are possible in today's day. Alcohol needs to be dropped down because the systolic blood pressure goes up. The diastolic also goes up in heavy drinkers. Get the weight down, no smoking. Seriously, we know this. And which medication you will give? Four choices. ACRBs, ACE or ARBs, CCBs, thiazide like diuretics, or you want to combine any two of the above. Please vote now. The the votes are, yes, the votes are coming in. We wait for another 10 seconds. Surely. Thiazide like diuretic, I understand, will be indepamide. So 55% say it is option A, which is ACE and ARB. And 34% go with D, which is any two combination of the above. Okay, fair enough. Let's look at the data which comes up. All right, so here is step one therapy. Use a ACE or a ARB or a CCB or diuretics. And there is really no way to know which one is better. There are trials that have placed one versus the other and both have done well. So you have to clinically look at a patient in step one and decide. Dual, low dose. Don't jump at a very high dose. But if it's not well controlled as a step two, you may want to give a ACE inhibitor with a CCB. A triple combination becomes an ACE inhibitor plus a CCB plus a diuretic and stage four adds a step four, sorry, adds a spironolactone. So this is the usual way in which uh, the combination therapies are used. Here are a databases which tries to look at all these RCTs, head-to-head -head comparisons in younger and older. So most blood pressure lowering classes are going to be equally effective in terms of how you will prevent the fatal and non-fatal event in older and younger. Whereas beta blockers, uh, 
as a person goes beyond a certain age, let's say about the age of 55 years, are going to lose its sheen and you're not going to recommend beta blocker to an older person. In fact, about the age of 55 years is going to be a challenge because the whole blood pressure profile will change to a more systolic rise of blood pressure than a diastolic rise of blood pressure. In the lesser ones, we may have some debate on how you are going to go about it. In a patient who requires a combination of blood pressure lowering medication, either a, a cinnabitter or as I said, you may selectively choose based on the patient a diuretic or CCB will get a better control of blood pressure over a period of time. Here was a a clinical study looking at perindropril 4 milligram with amlodipine or a perindropril and indepamide for 45 days and you can see the stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 working very well. So the treatment goals within 3 months is that you need to lower it down to less than 130 by 80 with a combination of AS inhibitor and a CCB. Here the prototype mentioned was perindropril 4 and amlodipine 5 milligrams which is there in the fixed drug combination, Dr. Arun. So that can be effectively given rather than trying to separate out too many medications, right? Uh, so in summary, hypertension in young has necessitated a re-evaluation of how our approach should be to the diagnosis. Let's put it as per the guidelines, identify which patient has organ damage, which patients do not have a secondary hypertension because that needs to be corrected at a different level. Correct the lifestyle modifications, use it to the best of advantage. Once you do that, then you can combine a RAS inhibition with AS inhibitor, either a calcium channel blocker which, or a diuretic. Both are very effective depending upon which class of patients you are looking at. So you may ask me this question that we are dealing with young hypertensives. And I am on the, all those studies which talks of beta blockers in young hypertensives and uh, in fact, there's just one registry which is we have just submitted for publication. Uh, let me tell you one thing uh, without even sharing any sort of results. That the strongest belief in this country if you're young hypertensive is still inhibition of the RAS system. Renin angiotensin system has to be inhibited in the young. It's stimulated because of different mechanisms. The whole pathophysiology of young hypertensives need to be addressed in terms of how you reduce the vascular risk. If you can tone down the pathophysiology of the vascular uh, and, and reduce the damage, over a period of time, the events which will accrue will reduce because it's a very long-term success that you are likely to get. And RAS inhibition works very, very well at that point of time. Thank you for the uh, time. And uh, Dr. Sandeep said, sir, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Uday. So let's start the discussion on this. So I'll take the discussion to Dr. Sumitra. Dr. Sumitra, what will be your first prescription for this patient? Yes. What? Uh, what, will your first prescri what drugs will you prescribe for this patient? Okay, okay. Uh, I understand. Uh, of course, he's a male, uh, 30 years male. So as Dr. Jadav said, I would go for a combination as per ESC guideline, I'll start with combination, whatever be the level of uh, blood pressure, with a fixed dose combination of a RAS blockade with a calcium channel blocker. I won't prefer too much of diuretic in younger patient because of the metabolic alteration the diuretic can produce, which have got a long-term consequence. And uh, calcium channel blocker is good, but in a case of female, if it is a 30 years old female, I would have been on my guard to start a RAS blockade because childbearing age, if there is a, there is a potential of getting pregnant, then uh, this is very risky to give any RAS blockade because of teratogenicity. So in this patient, uninhibited, I will give a combination of a RAS blockade, either S inhibitor or ARB with a calcium channel blocker. Between S inhibitor and ARB, I rather prefer S inhibitor in this patient because of the long-term metabolic gain which have got documentation in S inhibitor rather than ARB. So that will be my choice with a long-term, long-acting S inhibitor, either perindropril or ramipril, with a long-acting calcium channel blocker, preferably amlodipine. That will be my first choice. Okay, so we brought out one thing that between males and females, we would want to give it a thought that maybe S inhibitors would not be preferred because possibly they might go in for a pregnancy. So that's a thought. 
Okay, so the second thing I would like to bring out is what about imaging? Would you straight away want to go for a CT scan in all the patients or some of the patients or would you prefer to do an ultrasound in many of these patients? How would you make a choice, Dr. Sumitra? Uh, sir, I think uh, ultrasound is a baseline investigation to me as far as the availability is concerned in India. And it will give you so many things including the renal uh, structure, including the other adrenal and other, uh, uh, other possibilities. Not only the effect of blood pressure, but the cause of blood pressure. Both can be ascertained simultaneously by a properly done ultrasound. Renal artery Doppler, I routinely uh, do in many young patients if I suspect secondary hypertension or resistant hypertension. But further imaging, I will restrict. If I see only it is a resistant hypertension, or some unusual features, like as Dr. Uda, uh, Dr. Jadov said, like cafe, cafe all spots, something like that, then only I'll go for it. Otherwise, I'll restrict myself to ultrasound, renal artery Doppler, and the routine test as, as depicted by all the guidelines. Dr. Uday, do you agree or would you like to differ? No, sir, I agree with Dr. Swamitra that uh, we, we should do abdominal sonography, good quality abdominal sonography, Make a good preparation so that you get a good information both on basic ultrasound as well as renal artery Doppler study. Sir, if the patient is well prepared uh, with the bowels evacuated well, no gaseous distension, then the renal artery Doppler results and sensitivity specificity increases. And then you look at the clinical profile of the patient, match it with the ultrasounds, and if then there is a requirement, I completely agree. Then if you, rather than doing a urinary VMA and all that, which a lot of physicians do, I would completely disagree with that and say, let's go ahead and get imaging done at that point. Fine. So let's make the questions a bit more difficult. What about resistant hypertension? We manage the patient, patient is not getting controlled. The question is to both Dr. Oday and Dr. Sumitra. What, how would you manage resistant hypertension? You've done everything possible with the standard drugs. Patient's blood pressure is not getting controlled. Dr. Oday, how would you now modulate the therapy to resistant hypertension? Right. So with the optimum and therapy. Yes, sir. With the, uh, one thing is that when we talk about resistant, two things need to be absolutely sure. Get an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring done. So we are really, really going to label it as a true resistant hypertension, one. And uh, two, be absolutely sure that the lifestyle modifications are all in order rather than hiking up the drugs. Because unless we control those factors, the blood pressure at times may not really settle down. So after these two comments, then we optimize the dose of a RAS inhibitor, a diuretic, and a calcium channel blocker. And then the fourth add-on could be a spironolactone amongst the two MRAs. And I would stick to not more than 25 milligrams of spironolactron because at that dose it would help. If then there is a requirement, you have a gambit of other drugs which you can use. For example, you can use the central blocker like moxinidine. You also have a better blocker which is not put off the shelf in this patient. So you still have a vasodilating better blocker that, that can be added. So this is the medical therapy. The interventional therapy is a little different topic altogether. And uh, that, of course, is under clinical trial. Dr. Swamitra, if you want to add more. Uh, look, sir, I, I think resistant hypertension, I look from a different angle. I don't think it's an absolute term. It's a relative term. As you know, the fourth drug addition might control the blood pressure, but we still call it resistant hypertension. So why this terminology came? For two reasons. Number one, that we need to find out the secondary cause. That is a very important thing. You know, resistant hypertension means are we missing a secondary cause? That is number one. Number two, these patients are more apt or liable to develop target organ damage. Because of course, for long time or, or for many hours of a day, we cannot control the pressure. So on one hand, we have to intensify the therapy so that the resistant hypertension remains resistant by terminology, but actually the blood pressure is controlled by four or five drugs or intervention. But at the same time, the, find out the secondary cause. Younger the patient, the lower will be my threshold for a secondary cause. As we know, we will go all out to find out the secondary cause. So this is how I look at resistant hypertension, sir. Not from, uh, and as you said, I, I completely agree with Udoy that after the first three drugs, the fourth will be a mineral corticoid antagonist, and then I will add a beta blocker or an alpha blocker. We know both the Americans and, and Europeans say 
the five top most causes of secondary or resistant hypertension is renal parenchymal disease renovascular disease hyperparathyroidism obstructive sleep apnea which we miss which we often miss if the patient is not obese but we do not we forget that at least 50% of obstructive sleep apnea occurs with normal bmi or even lower bmi so we miss that completely and fifth is substance abuse so many patients take alternative not drugs even substances some chinese things some this and that maybe tobacco in certain form and we have to be very careful to find out that nothing is actually contradicting with our antihypertensive medicine so this what i look for sometimes i just admit the patient for a hospital for 24 hours and i get my answer because the patient is devoid of his usual environment and he is exposed so that's my approach to resistant hypertension okay thank you arun do we have questions from the audience uh, yes sir we have some questions so yes sir so we have some good questions from the audience i think the time is right the first question is from dr sk bhagra delhi who asks that what other comorbidity should be thought of in a patient that present with fluctuations in systolic bp and pulse rate especially in the afternoon and evening dr uday please i mean you know post pranidial hypotension right it was also called as the post siesta physiological drop in the blood pressure is noted in elderly people and therefore in hypertensive population also you will expect the blood pressure to go down on the abp charts also post meals and these graphs will have to be taken into consideration there is no specific entity in my opinion there is an entity of blood pressure variability we do not know the exact underlying pathophysiological mechanism by which it goes on vary there are factors which contribute but we don't have exact etiology but there is no exact entity where you say that the blood pressure and the pulse rate both fluctuates up and down as a separate systolic blood pressure entity no that's nothing of that sort however you can have individuals who behave in that way they may have reasons if you are a young you can have a higher sympathetic tone you may have a different lifestyle during the day time and that can contribute to the blood pressure in the elderly what i mentioned is important the postprandial hypotension is an important component thank you for that uh, the next question from dr rapi ramkrishna bhat that life so is lifestyle modification should be considered first in the management of hypertension in the young at all points of time whether it is uh, whatever the stage be as you looked at the chart and it's a continuing process of life i don't think it's a step one it's a continuing step all the life for all the stages of hypertension both in the young and in the elderly thank you Uh, dr vinay kapoor from panchkula asked that in case of sympathetic activity should the first line drug in youngs be arbs or beta blockers all right so we don't have a real real evidence that only heart rate necessarily is the denominator for a increased sympathetic activity that's open to some discussion however purely in terms of young hypertensive patient it's the ras inhibition that will change the vascular remodeling of the blood vessels prevent target end organ damage prevent uh, end events and therefore i will recommend that the beta blocker are a good drug the vasodilative in in the younger population that when they may not necessarily be the first line of therapy always thank you uh, dr r k das from raipur asked that sir what is the treatment of systolic hypertension according to you Oh, one of the best drug is indepamide. We had already the high weight data, and you have the AHA guideline in 2013 saying your step one choice should be a thiazide like diuretic. And the best evidence you had to date is with indepamide. Then you have, of course, the CCBs and the RAS inhibitions also. Uh, right, Dr. Shrikant Panda from Mumbai asks, sir, where do we exactly use diuretics, or is it only a third choice? No, 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 no. Diuretics are an excellent drug. like if you have looked at the indepamide monotherapy data on a sustained release both in the elderly and it a little younger and our own trials from our country strong efficient it works very very well so diuretics are always there they are they are not as a step 3 therapy in combination you may use a smaller dose of diuretic just to see how the blood pressure remains how the adverse profile is balanced otherwise uh, they are one of the more important therapy in fact there is a data from a study called legend recently which showed that thiazide like diuretics are very very good in preventing events this was released end of this year the legend data uh, 
there is one more question sir from dr sugi tandan chandigarh that an elderly 75 year old diabetic male with hypertension and diabetes for more than 20 years was treated 5 years back on a ace and amlodipine combination with dietor and later developed hypertension and again put on eslo 2.5 od now again bp is about 160 by 70 how do i manage it now okay i, I hope the the first statement said uh, diuretic and not dietor dietor is not the drug tosamide please don't use a loop diuretic as a initial choice it has to be a thiazide like diuretic so that's one secondly if this is a elderly patient and he is on a acccb and some diuretic dose you want to look at whether you optimize that dose because i don't see how eslo which is as amlodipine whether you are a believer or a non believer in racemic mixtures i don't see how that's going to be superior over a, a simple amlodipine or any other ccb so i don't think that's the way forward the way swamitra was trying to explain us initially is the only way to treat hypertension ras inhibition ccb diuretic next step optimize the dose then you have the other drugs i don't know i think we should go now to the next talk because yes uh, yes sir otherwise we'll shift uh, yes yes thank you so we'll uh, request dr sumitra ray to talk about hypertension in the elderly now thank you sir uh, thank you very much uh, it's it's a pleasure and a privilege to have dr sandeep said on board this is uh, such a sophisticated academically minded cardiologist i really encounter and you know uday whenever a patient comes from mumbai your patient he carries my telephone number for emergency you give you give that and i reciprocate that also <laughs> so that is our relation okay chalo management of hypertension in elderly a case based approach okay next please now go through the case very carefully a 76 years old man diabetic for 20 years no other past medical history non smoker no alcohol came for routine annual health checkup there is no symptom he is on metformin and glimepiride and atorvastatin 10 mg and tamsulosin for his prostate now 70 per minute pulse and regular bp was 146 by 84 supine and sitting 148 by 82 standing all four limbs are more or less equal systemic examination normal ecg is still okay but echo showed mild lvh with grade 1 lv diastolic dysfunction there is urine microalbumin between 30 and 300 it is 150 and egfr is 62 next please now full blood count is normal sodium potassium normal creatinine borderline 1.2 fasting sugar and pp sugar reasonably controlled 130 and 170 with hb1c 7.2% uric acid is 7.2 ldl cholesterol 80 triglyceride 212 thyroid normal liver function normal now i will go on question by question the main agenda please come go back sorry the main agenda will be does he need antihypertensive medicine if yes what to start what is the target what to monitor and any other medicine to be adjusted so that is the broad perspective i will talk for next 13 14 minutes next please so first question first does he need antihypertensive medicine for your reference his sitting blood pressure is 146 by 84 yes or no go for poll please quick yes sir we are receiving some queries another 10 second will give now let me uh, tell you that this is not the first record he has got a previous record and i asked him to come back after 7 days and he got this kind of record for 3 days now does he need antihypertensive medicine yes or no sir 80% 80% have gone with yes 83% now you are right why i will tell you next please now why this person has got a higher cardiovascular risk than an ordinary person pulse pressure in older people more than 60 is a cardiovascular risk in my case it is 62 echocardiography showing lvh 
it is a high cardiovascular risk. Microalbuminuria is a cardiovascular risk. CKD, he is still 62 EGFR. 30 to 60 is the borderline. So this person has got two or three, three evidences already of high cardiovascular risk. And there is evidence of target organ damage in view of microalbuminuria and LVH. So, of course, he does not require an ambulatory blood pressure or home blood pressure at this stage for diagnosis because his office blood pressure recording is going parallel with his target organ damage. There is no contradiction between the two. So I can assume this patient is having latent hypertension, undetected hypertension for last few months or few years. So I am ready to start medicine. Next, please. And you know, initiation of hypertension, BP lowering drug and lifestyle intervention are recommended in fit older people between 65 and 80. My patient is 76. When systolic pressure is 140 to 160, provided that treatment is well tolerated. How do you know treatment is well tolerated unless you start the treatment? So you have to start the treatment class 1A. Of course, lifestyle management will go on. Next, please. Now, for your simplicity, 65 to 79, BP 140 by 90, you are class 1A indication to start blood pressure treatment, both lifestyle and pharmacotherapy. If it is above 80, your threshold is 160 by 90, by euro. Next, please. What about ACC? You say, why are you ignoring half of the world? I'm not ignoring. Look, treatment of hypertension is recommended for non-institutionalized, that means socially living, ambulatory, community-dwelling adult above 65 with an average blood pressure of 130 or higher. So even 130, not even 140. So I am even more allowed to start pharmacotherapy in this person of 76 years with the blood pressure of 146 systole. Next, please. So answer yes, I endorse with the majority. Now next question is monotherapy or combination therapy? That is very quickly, five seconds. Monotherapy or combination therapy? So we are getting replies another four seconds, sir, we'll give. Hello. Okay, so 68% go with monotherapy, sir. 68? Yes. So two third, one third. Yes, I understand why is this. I was expecting 50-50. I'll tell you why. Now go to question two. Ras blockage, CCB, diuretic, beta blocker. If you choose one, if you choose one, what will you choose? Go for answer five seconds. Answers are pouring in, sir. We'll give another two, three seconds. Okay, so, sir, 50% say RAS blockers, 42% is CCB and 7% diuretic. Okay, chalo, good. Next, next slide, please. Now, you know the core drug treatment as the ESC has given us in 2018 is RAS blockage is a must. Along with that, you can choose either a CCB or a diuretic. That is a standard therapy. An initial therapy has to be a dual combination, whatever be your blood pressure. Even if it is 141, just one millimeter high, you are supposed to give two medicine in a fixed dose combination, one pill. Next, please. What about elderly people? They have given very clearly. In older patients, treated according to the standard regime. In very old patients, that is above 80, it may be appropriate to initiate with monotherapy. Mine is 76, a bit borderline, you know. So I, I was expecting 50% will tell monotherapy, 50% will tell dual therapy. In older patient, when combination is used, it is recommended, you see older patient, not old patients. So it is above 65, not above 80. Old means above 80, older means 65 above. When combination therapy is used, it is recommended that this is initiated at the lowest available dose. Very interesting. Lowest available dose. 
it may not be a fixed dose combination because fixed dose combination give a mid dose, a standard dose, but lowest available dose in that country need to be chosen. We forget this line, we overlook this line. Next please. What about kidney? My patient has got 1.2 creatinine, 72 uh, urea, EGFR 60, 62. No difference. RAS block it plus CCB or diabetic, no difference. Next please. My patient is diabetic. Anything else recommended with a RAS blockade, with CCP or thiazide? No difference. So I am absolutely okay to start with RAS blockade, either alone or with a CCB or a thiazide diuretic. Next, please. High weight trial is a very landmark trial, I tell you, a bit out of the way because UV and stop age showed in elderly patient over 80. There is no benefit of treating. Shape and CSTO said, yes, you can reduce some stroke, but no effect on mortality. So why should you treat? Next, please. High weight is the first trial above 80 years, which treated with indepamide and perindopril vis-a-vis placebo. And what did they find? Next. If you see the p-values, significant p-value, in death from any cause. Fantastic result, 0 0.02, death from any cause. Then you get significant p-value, any heart failure or any cardiovascular event. You just miss the p-value in not fatal or non-fatal stroke, death from stroke and uh, death from cardiovascular cause. These you narrowly miss. And where there is no effect is uh, heart attack. There is no effect. Next, please. Just to be to keep you in perspective, our own Indian uh, uh, College of Physician, CSI, and Indian Hypertension Society last year produced this uh, anti-hypertension guideline, where they said monotherapy to start with in older patient, either calcium blocker or diuretic. Now you are in a dilemma. If it is monotherapy. In older patient, whether it is RAS blockade or calcium blockade or diuretic, because the ESC is silent on this. Next, please. So, keeping everything in mind, what I started in this 76 years old gentleman, 2 milligram of perindopril, lowest available dose, 2 milligram of perindopril and 1.5 milligram of indepamide. Why indepamide? Because of the high weight trial. Why perindopril? I prefer always ACE inhibitor over ARB, particularly in high cardiovascular risk patient. And this patient has got three points for high cardiovascular risk, as I have already mentioned. Why perindopril among ACE inhibitor? Only ramipril and perindopril are long acting. They work for 24 hours. Enalapril does not work for 24 hours. So it is a natural choice. Next, please. Now at follow-up at three months, what do I get, sir? Patient is as usual, okay, pulse is steady. Now the sitting BP is 124 by 76. That there is no postural drop. It was 146 by 84. Now it is 124 by 76. Creatinine has gone up to 1.4. Sodium is steady. Plus potassium has gone up from 4.5 to 4.8. And EGFR has gone down from 62 to 56, now he is in stage one CKD. Next. So the next question, what is the target BP? Just go for systolic only five seconds. Below 140, below 130, below 120. Five seconds. Age is 76. A couple more seconds, we are getting some answers. Yes. So 61%, 56% uh, go with option A. Uh -huh. And 44 go with option B. Aha. Uh -huh. Excellent. Indians are wiser people than the rest of the world. Excellent. Chalo, next. So you see the spring trial has got a dedicated elderly arm. It is 
above 75 it's a pre specified sub group and what we get in above 75 my patient is 76 mind it what was there it was presented in american geriatric society annual symposium in 2016 next please and they said look from shape it was 160 jnc said 140 jnc h said 150 and sprint said 120 should ah go for uh, 120 that was the question raised that uh, annual geriatric so uh, american geriatric society 2016 annual convocation that will aha call it 120 for geriatric people let's see what happened next please because they showed in that subgroup analysis of sprint 134 versus 123 in elderly people above 75 what is the result Next, primary outcome, significant reduction with 124. All cause mortality, significant reduction, 33% reduction in um, 124 group compared to 134 group. Can you believe this? Next, please. But what is the flip side? What happened more in those high intensity uh, blood pressure? Hypotension more, syncope more, Electrolyte abnormality more, acute kidney injury more. Do you want that? Next, please. So they concluded, sprint senior, hypotension, syncope, electrolyte, kidney injury were more, but no rate of injurious fall. Overall, benefit of 124 rather 134 is 33% reduction in primary CV outcome and 32% reduction in total mortality. Next. Is my patient is a sprint geriatric person? No, because he is diabetic. That is excluded. He has got type 1, grade 1, left ventricular diastolic failure. That is excluded. So my patient is not a sprint geriatric patient. And you know the sprint, how you take the blood pressure? The patient sits in the, uh, in the solitude. Nobody comes there. Nobody talks automatic blood pressure, I cannot do that in my uh, clinic. So sprint is not for me, sprint is not for Indian. Next please. Even the Americans say, you see, older patient above 65, diabetes, CKD, my patient, 130 by 80 is the threshold, below 130 by 80 is my target. Not 120 by 80, just they mentioned 130 by 80. Next please. And what they said, older patient above 65, that is ACC, America, with hypertension and a high burden of comorbidity and maybe limited life expectancy, clinical judgment, patient preference, and a team-based approach to assess the risk versus benefit is reasonable for decision regarding intensity of treatment. So they have given a liberty to choose. Don't follow sprint blindly. Next. Europeans are so wise. You see, not below 120 in red. Yes, you go below 130, but whatever be the age, even if you are 18 year old person, even if you are a 20 years old young star, your systolic should not go below 120. Next please. So if it is 18 to 65, do not go below 120 by 70. 65 to 79, do not go below 130 to 70. So my patient, we should not go below 130 by 70. My patient has got blood pressure 124. So what should I do next? Tell me, continue same, drop perindopril, drop indepamide, drop tamsulosin. Five seconds. His blood pressure is 124 by 76 now. Four, three, two, one. So as of now, 100% go with A. Continue same. Yes. 124 by 76. Aha. What the Europeans are saying, don't go below 130 if your blood pressure, if your age is above 65. I'm a very European-minded person. Next, please. 
So I dropped perindopril. Why I dropped perindopril and not indepamide? Now I found that this person's creatinine is slightly going up. His EGFR is now in the CKD stage one instead of uh, normal. Uh, and more importantly, his potassium is creeping up even in presence of indepamide from 4.5 to 4.8. So I thought if I have to drop one, I better drop the perindopril. He might have got some underlying atherosclerosis in his renal arteries, which I did not check. Next, please. What to monitor? Next. Europeans and everybody is saying close monitoring of adverse effect if the patient is above 65. What to monitor? Next. Yes, he said postural BP should be closely monitored and symptoms. And I said my patient did not have postural BP. Unless required for concomitant disease, loop diuretic and alpha blockers should be avoided. And renal function should be frequently assessed to detect possible increase in creatinine and reduction of EGFR. I did all the right things and on judgment, I took the perindopril off. Perhaps I did the right thing. Next, please. No, I missed something. Go back. Oh, sorry. Yes. And in the older adult, above 65, I need to keep in mind if it is a resistant hypertension or I think of secondary hypertension, atherosclerotic renovascular disease comes the top of the list. So I should do a ultrasound, as I mentioned in, in Uday's case also, we should do a very good ultrasonography of the abdomen to see the kidney size, kidney texture, and the renal artery Doppler along with thyroid text. Next, please. So what to monitor? That is not a question. We monitor symptom, general health and frailty of the patient, whether the patient has got enough social support, physical parameters, pulse, blood pressure, and postural blood pressure, blood biochemistry, particularly kidney, and cardiac and renal supervision. We need to do all this in anybody above 65 years. Next, please. This is my last slide. Any other medicine to be adjusted? Go one by one, very quickly. Optimize diabetes control. His HB1C 7.2, are you happy or not? Yes or no? Do you need further treatment? Yes, or I am happy? That means no. Quick, five seconds. Quick, quick. Quick, sir. Uh, sir, yes. Since there are too many questions, the replies are taking time. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. So, so I for think, all, I for think all... I, I, what I will tell that diabetes control at 76 is okay. 7.2 HB1 say I will accept. 130 fasting, 170 uh, PP, I will accept because any any attack of hypoglycemia will be detrimental in at this age. It might cause a cardiac arrest, which I can't afford to take. So I am happy with 7.2 and I will continue with glimeparide and metformin. Reconsider tamsulosin. Yes, you know, uh, psilodosin might have a lesser potential to reduce blood pressure. So I might shift to psilodosin in this patient and the minimum possible dose maybe four milligram of psilocin, not eight milligram. Even with tamsulosin, I might opt for 0.2 milligram and not 0.4 milligram. Of course, with consultation with my urology colleague. To treat uric acid at 7.2, patient is asymptomatic. Now our textbook teaching by Harrison's book is that you do not treat uric acid unless there is first attack of gout. Asymptomatic hyperuricemia is not treatable. But that was for gout. Nowadays, we know that uric acid causes nephropathy. Uric acid causes cardiac damage. At the same time, we know uric acid is the strongest naturally occurring antioxidant in the body. So there is some conflicting result. And I am confused whether to treat this uric acid. I will ask my moderator and my colleague in the next session. 
to treat triglyceride 212 years or no after age of 75 even you need to treat ldl cholesterol is controversial it is medical legal issues and if you see the guidelines they say above 75 unless the patient is secondary prevention for primary prevention you need to discuss risk versus benefit very clearly with the patient before starting statin so i will be happy with tg212 without unnecessarily changing the atorvastatin 10 mg which he is getting to continue so i rest my case over here with a thank you and it is open to the forum thank you dr somitra so let's just take up each of the questions which you raised in the end so dr uday uh, let's see when the patient was initially treated he already had the beginnings of ckd and that's the time when uh, ras inhibition was started he's 76 had he been younger maybe we would have treated differently what do you think of uh, sglt2 inhibitors to protect the kidney so he's he's diabetic he has the beginnings of renal disease he is hypertensive and diabetic and sglt2 inhibitors are coming in to protect the kidneys and prevent future heart failure he already has the beginnings of heart failure in the form of diastolic heart failure in this age group in this setting would you also consider switching one of the diabetic agents to a sglt2 inhibitor that's the first question yes i think the evidence is so very strong here there are two aspects which uh, professor dr sandeep shat sir mentioned one is that uh, you know if you look at a meta analysis irrespective of which one of the drug and if you look at individual sglt2 inhibitors the basic is it reduces the renal composite outcome in diabetics by 45% so the biggest thing that sglt2 offers is protection against proteinuria urine albumin excretion the worsening of renal function the worsening to the stage of esrd this becomes a very fundamental reason why in diabetics with hypertension with impaired gfr and you have approval as of now going down up to 45 and it will go in in terms of further improvement also one two that uh, there is a, a level of um, improvement you get in patients who have a heart failure systolic with reduced ejection fraction for sure and certain for preserved ejection fraction or a diastolic heart failure you will still expect the drug to work well because primarily it works very well as a aqua uresis and being a very high capacity low affinity sglt2 receptor inhibitor you are going to get a great advantage in terms of how it will work on the sodium transport and get off the fluid load in fact it can spare some of the drugs of ace inhibitors and loop diuretic so sir i am very much for using and changing to sglt2 inhibitors thank you sir may i add sir sir you have done such a clever it is a googly it's a fantastic googly i'm totally bowled out and sir additional point is that with that sglt2 insertion we may not require any anti hypertensive because yes. it reduces 5 by 3 mm of systolic and diastolic and it might be just 140 by 80 with that so i had some to you sir maybe in my next patient i'll think of that yeah yeah it can be used for sure you know you know it's excellent excellent sir fantastic what about uh, atorvastatin 10 mg because on 10 mg you got a ldl of 80 and uh, as dr sumitra said the patient is 76 year old so most of the guidelines that after 75 become helpless so what would you do so the evidence for statins in elderly is as robust as the evidence for statins in the young it continues to accrue its benefits even in the elderly for cb benefits and uh, if you look at uh, the studies and the recommendation even for elderly statins at a modest dose is good i am saying modest just as a clinician because in elderly people you need to look at all of the things they have a lesser muscle mass they may be frail there may be reasons why you want to tone down a very high intensity statin now that's also subject to discussion but i don't think there is any discussion of using a moderate intensity statin it continues to work right till the age of 90 we have clinical data up to the age of 90 sir 
I think most of us are not actually giving 40 milligrams in the LD. We actually give very, very low doses. We give 5 to 10 milligrams. We... What about Dr. Sumitra? I think you already made a point that it's relevant to give a very low dose. Sir, okay. only we are talking about primary prevention setup. And in primary prevention in diabetic patient, the only study was the CART study, which gave blanketly atorvastatin 10 milligram and showed cardiovascular and mortality benefit. There is no other study which actually looked into this particular segment in this manner, primary prevention, diabetic patient. So atorvastatin 10 milligram, I think in all diabetic patient, blanketly should be given. We can only upgrade it if there is more indication to upgrade it. Otherwise, that is the baseline treatment for me. Okay, Arun, maybe we can straight away take the questions because I think we are running out of time now. Let's take the questions straight away. Right, sir, quickly. Dr. Maidar from Delhi asked, an old patient more than 80 years, since the survival is less, is there any benefit in initiating therapy with ACE inhibitors rather than CCBs? Dr. Sumitra? Yes, in very elderly people above 80, we have to be a little careful while starting RAS inhibition, particularly if the creatinine is borderline. Because many of these, some of these patients have got atherosclerotic renal artery disease. And if it is bilateral, then even a, a short course of RAS blockade can precipitate acute kidney injury. So unless we exclude it from the beginning, uh, it is very difficult to give RAS blockade. And as already mentioned in the younger people, RAS blockade and beta blockade are not so effective antihypertensive in elderly. So rather calcium blocker and diuretic are better suited or better potent diuretic in case of elderly. That was the reason I actually withdrew the RAS blockade in the first instance, but kept on the diuretic. So I would rather go above 80 with a monotherapy with the lowest dose of diuretic available in the market or lowest dose of calcium channel blocker available in the market. I perhaps won't start RAS blockade in above 80 without any pressing need for it. Right. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev from Tinsuki asks, what is the best drug in elderly hypertensives with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction? Yes, you know, uh, now elderly comes, takes a low priority. Heart failure is reduced, reduced ejection fraction is the disease which is more important than hypertension. So the standard treatment of heart failure reduced ejection fraction, that means a RAS blockade, including RNA, a beta blockade, and MRA. They need to come step by step. Hypertension will be automatically controlled. Rather, here the problem is tolerance, whether there is too much of hypotension. So rather, we have to put them very gently, the lowest dose, with monitoring of postural hypertension, potassium, and renal function. Keeping these three in mind, we keep on treating heart failure reduced ejection fraction. Of course, in diabetic or even in non-diabetic segment, HGLD2 inhibitor is now comes in the picture as uh, class one or, uh, or in, on the top of the list. But here, heart failure will take the priority over age and over hypertension. Right. Uh, Dr. Sambhu from Vizag asks, why in India Telmisartan is the most popular ARBs, although it has most scant data? Why not other ARBs or ACE inhibitors? Look, as far as cardiovascular disease is concerned, apart from hypertension, the most robust data is with Valsartan. Second in line is Losartan. Third is Almisartan and Telmisartan at par. Almisartan has got some conflicting results. Tell certain has got on target and other things, which is quite neutral. But the problem is that both Valsartan and Losartan are short acting. And you need at least twice a day dose for Losartan, preferably three times a day dose to get the benefit. For 24 hours, blood pressure control. That is the advantage of Tell Me Certain that it gives you a 36 hours blood pressure control. And the most important thing is not scientific, but it is commercial. The Telmisartan has got 100 companies, so the market noise is very high. You get all the types of combination that you want with anything, with any dose. You get a Telmisartan combination, double, triple, which you do not get with Valsartan or with Losartan. So that is why physicians, by common psychology and convenience of use, use Telmisartan. I won't blame them because it serves your purpose, though this is not the 
ARB for heart failure. This is not the ARB post MI. This is not the A not the ARB for high risk cardiovascular patient. Then you perhaps have to taking some pain go for valsartan or losartan. Uh, Doctor Suhas from Ahmedabad asks: Is the choice of drugs important for reducing cardiovascular risk in young patients, or is just achieving BP target enough? Doctor Uday, Uday should I? It's for young people. Sir, say it again, sir. Because there was. So, share. I'll, I'll repeat it, sir. Doctor Suhas from Ahmedabad asks: Is the choice of drugs important for reducing cardiovascular risk in young patients, or just achieving BP target is enough? No, no, no. It's very important to reduce the cardiovascular risk. Blood pressure is lowered by all medications. That's why no guidelines give you you a choice saying that as a monotherapy you select one class or the other. But as a wise man, you will have to see which class of drug will give a long-term benefits. It's a long-term investment, positive investment that you have to look at. That's why vascular damage are best prevented by a RAS inhibitor. As Dr. Swamitra was saying, there is so much of evidence with ACE inhibitors. I'll just interfere here, sir. Ten years ago, Uddha, you will remember, and of course, uh, sir, you will remember that in every cardiology seminar there was a debate. Whether the blood pressure target uh, is the number more important or the mode of reducing is more important, and there was a debate. For last ten years, the debate has gone down because we thought, yes, the value is more important. One thirty, eighty, one forty, ninety. However, you achieve it. Off late again. Now we are we have made the cake. Now we are thinking about the icing. Whether we can decorate the cake a bit again without spoiling the basic substance of the cake or the meat. So now we know the meat. We now convinced that we need 140 by 90 or 130 by 80. Now we can afford the luxury of choosing our drug to get the extra benefit after achieving the target. I put it in that way. So in today's world, yes, it is important, isn't it? Right. Uh, we can have one more question, sir. Doctor Manish Chabra from Lucknow asks: Sir, many doctors are prescribing beta blockers for young patients for hypertension, despite guidelines not recommended. Your comments? Okay, that's for me, Arun, Doctor Jadhav here. Yeah. So there are no guidelines in the first place for young hypertensives. Neither they have evolved nor they are evolving uh, because. Clinical trials have never really enrolled young hypertensives. The average age of all the major five clinical trials is 62.3 years. So nothing is going to happen in terms of guideline very quickly. Now, can you give beta blockers to a young hypertensive in absence of guideline? Beta blocker will have a role to play. We cannot sort of say no to that because there is a sympathetic overdrive uh, aspect to it and there is a, a lot of concern about very high heart rate accompanying high blood pressure contributing to problems so having said that you'll have to be sure what sort of beta blocker you are going to choose whether that alone is going to remodel the vessels well whether that's going to reduce the arterial wall thickening whether it will prevent the plaques from accumulating and whether events are going to get better. That's something that means beta blocker therapy related CV outcome trials in hypertensive subjects are just not there. That's a problem. So it's nothing against beta blocker in my opinion. It's that we have some paucity of literature and clinical trials because of which we cannot confidently say at all steps that look, here is the drug and nothing else will work. No, we can't say that. Right. So, sir, there's a lot of other questions, but I think uh, since we have overshot the time, it's time to wrap up. So, over to Dr. Sandeep, sir. Okay, it was a wonderful session. And I think with such excellent speakers, we would always have a wonderful session. But I think all good things have to end at some point. I really enjoyed this session with Dr. Uday and Dr. Sumitra, but then sessions with them are always wonderful to have. Thank you, Arun, and thank you, Nishita, for uh, conducting such a wonderful session. And all the people whom, who are there in the background whom we don't know, I think it's over from my side. Arun, if you want to say a few last words. Yes, sir. So, uh, rightly said, sir, it was a privilege to be a part of this intellectual feast. I mean, such uh, high caliber speakers. And of course, with you moderating the session, it was indeed an icing on the cake. I think the audience, as well as us, including the whole team at Backend, thoroughly enjoyed this session. So we thank you wholeheartedly. Uh, uh, 
uh, you know, Dr. Uday sir, Dr. Somitra Ray sir, and of course, Dr. Sandeep sir for taking time out and making it possible for us. And all the audience, again, uh, we thank them uh, for sparing time for attending this intellectual uh, feast of a session today. And lastly, we would just again like to remind that what is in store in the course. So this is just the day one of the course and we are just starting. So we have three more days coming up. So tomorrow, June 28th, same time, 7 to 8 p.m. We'll have a very interesting session. There were some couple of questions today on diabetes and DKD patients. So we will have a multi-speciality panel tomorrow headed by Dr. Tirthankar Chaudhary. So we'll have a panel with a nephrologist perspective and an endocrinologist perspective. We'll have Dr. Saumik and Dr. Sandeep. So that is for tomorrow. And we hope that we see all of you uh, again uh, at the same time. So from uh, at Servia Pharmaceutical Servia, we again thank the medical community wholeheartedly for spearheading us through this troubled times. Once again, thank you to all the eminent speaker and the moderators and to all the attendees. Thank you so much and wish you good night and all of you stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandeep sir and Somito. Thank you, Dr. Aru. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Pleasure.